question. When a scientist thinks about themselves, or when scientists think about themselves, what do they think about? Now, not an individual scientist like me thinking about myself, but when scientists collectively think about themselves collectively, what do they have in mind? How to make the world a better place. Let me explain my question. So, if I talk to a body of students who have different aspirations, one of them wants to go into the political establishment, one of them wants to go into the legal profession. These words that we use to talk about things, body, establishment, profession, are important. Partly because they tell us something about the way historically that group has been viewed, and partly because they form our view of that group for the future. So then asking a student body, how do scientists think about themselves collectively? So a scientist is a member of a scientific community, which might on the face of it seem strange in as much as when you think of a scientist, you think of one crazy guy in a lab coat, if you think of scientists at all. When you learn to write scientific reports, you're told to remove all mention of the actual scientist that did it. The laser power was increased, as if by magic. It's almost as if scientists are somehow embarrassed that scientists exist. They just want to put the science out there as objectively and unhumanly as possible. But our language betrays us. In the same way as a body of students forms itself into a student union, a scientific community, for example, I belong to the Austrian Physical Society. Again, this word of society, community, it comes up. It betrays the fact that however objective and unhuman we would like to be, the scientific process is at core a community endeavor. So, there's a lot of talk about um, scientific literacy, understanding science from educators, politicians, the general public, that they should understand what science is about. And it's nice to think that you know that e equals mc squared, but I'm going to argue today that more important for understanding science is to understand that at core science is a community endeavour. So, there's a way that people sometimes think of science that basically science looks like this. Okay. You put the data in the top, you turn the handle, and the results come out the end. This is how science works, we kind of think. And in this picture, there are three things that a scientist can do. They can shovel data into the top, they can turn the handle, or they can write the results up that come out the end. There's no community in this picture. So, there's just one guy doing this. He can specialize in this, and he doesn't need anyone to, he just shovels it in. Or we can turn the handle, or we can pick up the results. They don't have to interact with each other. One scientist could do all three jobs, or he could specialize. Which means, if my main aim today is to try and convince you that society, uh, science works in community, that either means that my whole thesis is wrong, or that this picture doesn't tell us the whole story. So, I'm going to just work through this bit by bit and see where maybe the bits of the story are missing. What do we put in the top? So, uh, some time ago I was, I was working on building iron traps. I want to take a single atom, pull an electron off, and I want to hold it somewhere. And I can build devices to do this. This is the device, and this is a little cloud of atoms sitting above it. Now, schematically it looks like this. And importantly, these are cold. And when I say cold, I mean this is about three millionths of a degree above absolute zero, and this is about room temperature. So it's a hundred million times hotter than the ions. And it's about half a millimetre away. And it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that when you put a very cold thing next to a hot thing, the cold thing heats up. And this is what we observe, but the big puzzle was it was heating up about a billion times faster than we would naively expect it to. So we need to put something in the top, we need to put some data in, but the question is what data do we put in? 
This machine doesn't tell us what data it wants. So you can say, well, maybe the material I make it of is significant. Maybe if I make it of gold or of copper, it makes a difference. Is that the kind of thing that's worth considering? Is that the data that's worth putting in the top? And the answer is yes. But then we have a spectrum here. And you say, is what I had for breakfast going to be important? And the answer is probably not. My breakfast has not changed my results in the lab. So we can ignore this. And those two are obvious, but there are lots of things in the middle which are kind of grey. So for example, is it worth considering the surface finish of my metal? Probably, but conceivably it's irrelevant. Is it worth considering the number of sunspots that day? Probably not, but we did come up with one or two models where it might have been relevant. So within this mechanistic scientific model, there is no way of saying this is the information that's important and this is not. Because until we understand the problem, we don't know what we need to learn about. But if we understood the problem, then we wouldn't be doing the research because there wouldn't be a question to ask. So what do scientists do? I spent four years going around and talking to people, other scientists. There's one view that says, well, just shovel as much stuff into the top as possible. We don't understand, but hopefully we'll get lucky and we'll find something out. There's another view that says, well, stop, go back to the beginning. Look at all of our assumptions, everything we ever thought. What have we assumed? What did we not even realize we assumed? What do we assume but never talk about? And if you go for the option of picking out your assumptions, you'll spend a long time doing that and you'll slowly but surely get there. And if you just throw things in the top, maybe you'll get lucky and maybe you'll spend your entire life doing random experiments. This mechanism doesn't tell us. So what scientists do is within community, they discuss it sometimes passionately, what exactly you should do. Now, to cut a long story short, um, what actually the cause of this heating that we didn't understand was that there wasn't one single thing causing the problem. There were many things. There were at least six different mechanisms we identified. But to understand those mechanisms, we needed to find a surface scientist, a material scientist, an electrical engineer, a theorist, an experimentalist, someone who's prepared to run ahead and just try crazy ideas, and someone who's prepared step by step to work things through. We needed a community of scientists. So. Here, this picture of one guy shoveling stuff in the top is, is, is too simplistic. We need a community. Now, moving on. How long should we turn the handle for? Um, to give a quick clue, turning it forever and never stopping, just cranking the handle is probably not a good way to do science because it gets boring after the first thousand years. At some point, you want to move on and do something else. But saying, we'll just turn it once is probably not the right answer either. And somewhere in the middle is where it gets interesting. So when people look, for example, for the Higgs boson, they got sufficient data that the probability of a false positive, the probability of thinking it was there when it wasn't, was one in three million. Now they could have spent another 10 years and another $10 billion to get that probability down to one in 30 billion. One in 300 billion, it's still not certainty. But at some point you have to stop and say, enough's enough, we're gonna move on to another question. If you spend an extra couple of years trying to be more certain of the Higgs boson, no one's gonna die, it's not a problem. On the other hand, in medical sciences, the longer you wait to just double check that your cure works, people are dying. Which is why in medical sciences you say, one chance in 20 is good enough. So let me show you a map. Now, if you'll excuse the great oversimplification, roughly speaking, the countries shown in red on this map are the countries that pour significant amounts of money into scientific research on things like climate change. And they've worked out that climate change is happening. The world is almost certainly getting warmer. And they're pretty sure they know what's causing it. But almost certainly and pretty sure is not absolutely certain and absolutely sure. So you can always say we should turn the handle for longer. We can refine our models more. We can check whether or not 
the world has so far warmed up by 0.82 degrees or by 0.79 degrees. We can get the precision higher and higher. But at some point we have to ask, should we keep turning the handle? We can flip the question around and say, when should we stop turning the handle? If I show you another picture, this marks in red, if you'll excuse the oversimplification, this marks in red the countries that are most going to get hurt by climate change. It's not coincidental that the guys who have enough money to invest in research into climate change are also the guys that have enough money to pay for bigger air conditioners or bigger flood defences. So the scientists sitting up here can quite happily keep on turning the handle and refining their theories and it's not going to hurt them just yet, whereas the guys sitting down here are going to get hurt. So the question, when should we stop turning the handle in this situation, while being an integral part of science, is not just limited to philosophers of science in an ivory tower. It is a world-changing, life-changing moral question. It's interesting that science here, when to stop turning the handle, suddenly becomes a moral question. Who's the best per placed to answer that question? Now, you want someone who understands the scientific theories, who understands the present state of knowledge, who knows what the strong points are, what we don't really know or understand yet, the strengths and the weaknesses of the particular theories, the opportunities and the threats of the given technological solutions. The people best placed to work out when to stop turning the handle and move on to a different question, to stop describing the problem and start solving it, are the scientists themselves involved in it. Now some people might say the scientists should just do the science and leave the decisions up to the politicians. So the scientists explain the results as best they can to the politicians, they hope that the politicians have understood it, and we just have to give the politicians some moral training and hope that the politicians aren't corrupt. Well, maybe that's a good idea, or maybe we can just short circuit the entire process and say, why don't we give some moral formation to the scientists to explain to them as a community the bigger issues involved? So, why then is this important? Firstly, if you consider science to be a machine like this, then when you're training scientists, the questions you need to train them for are learn this equation, learn this theory, learn this experimental technique. The idea of a scientist's hopes, aspirations, beliefs, values, social ability, are at best irrelevant to the scientific process and at worst detrimental to the scientific process. On the other hand, if science works as a community, then questions like we can measure this but should we, we can build this but should we, become then integral to the formation of a scientist. Do they play well with others? The lone mad scientist can't cut it in the world of science. So, why then is that interesting to you guys here today, given half of you aren't scientists. So if, again, we have this picture where it's just this mechanism, then people from other fields, from politics, from philosophy, from theology, from art, from marketing, are bystanders to the scientific process. They can watch and they are recipients, thankful recipients, of whatever comes out the end of our machine. Oh look, a new picture of the universe from the Hubble Space Telescope. Thank you very much. Or a new medical cure. Or a new mobile phone. But they are detached from, have no say in, the churning of the handle of the scientific process. If, on the other hand, this is a community endeavour where values are important, where the idea of what we want to achieve through the science, why we are asking these questions, take on an important weight in the scientific process, then you too become involved in the formation of the scientific community. Because within community is where and how science does and must happen. And that's why it's vitally important that everyone 
in all communities that are affected by science understand how science works. Thank you very much.